Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to remind everybody that we are currently taking submissions for the Halloween listener special. That is a 500 word hard limit. If you want to take a look at the requirements, it is on alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. You can also listen to 2018 Halloween listener episode. So again, we would love your submissions. This is a listener only. Holly, Mark, me, and uh, possible other uh, narrator. Nobody else is getting their submissions in. Just our listeners. So you guys go ahead, take a look at the requirements, and get your submissions in. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is... Keeping story scenes on target. <laughs> it was off target. <laughs> I think we'll keep that in. Today's topic <laughs> is keeping scenes on target. So we had a question in our podcast forum where it was about scenes. So we decided to go ahead and make an episode on this. So I'll go ahead and read the question and then we'll get into it. My scenes tend to drag on like 3000 plus words. I'd like to get better at getting in, getting out, and getting it done. What are the elements that need to be in a scene versus the, quote, extra stuff that should be out? Oh, that should be cut. Okay. Um, That is a really good question. And what needs to be in a scene? And I have gone over this before. It's protagonist, antagonist, conflict, setting, and twist. But believe it or not, You can write an entire scene in three words. And you don't want it to be your first scene. You want to have built up a little bit of of story background and and have the reader know where you're going. But at one point or another, you can have an entire scene done in three words. Lawrence Block was a master at this, and he was the one from whom I learned this trick. And uh, I am going to steal and paraphrase a three-word scene by Lawrence Block, because um, I actually his his was Chip. I'm pregnant. Uh, I'm going to use Bob. I'm pregnant because Bob is my character. Bob is Bob is my my poor guy. <laughs> um, okay, now why is that a scene? How does that meet protagonist versus antagonist in a setting with a twist? Um, well, first off, it, let's let's take a look at. Bob being an unwilling father, which was the situation in which uh, Lawrence Block used it with one of his chip books. Um, the, The character who says it is, in this case, the antagonist. She's the female, the person who's pregnant. This is just for the scene. This, she isn't right. necessarily the novel's antagonist. Right, exactly. But for the scene, now, and we have covered this elsewhere, the protagonist and the antagonist of a scene are not always the protagonist and antagonist of the book. Everybody who is the point of view character of a scene is generally the protagonist of the scene, even if it's the villain. In this situation... The antagonist is the girl who is saying she's pregnant. Um, The protagonist is the guy who did not want to be a father. The setting is implied. It is any place where these two people are together where she dropped this news. But the Um, setting in this case is really nothing. Right. Yeah. There is no setting. So, like, every single scene doesn't have to have... If you're going for a three-word scene, you do not have to explicitly describe, obviously, yeah. the setting. You know, <laughs> this, In this case, the conflict was so big that it overrode the need for the setting. The conflict yeah. being Buddy, 
I'm knocked up, you're going to be a father, <laughs> for a character who was not looking for a long-term commitment ever. That was this guy. Um, and then, okay, protagonist, antagonist, conflict. Conflict was the you, the pregnancy itself, and the setting was, you know, implied. And the twist. And the twist. Well, the twist is what we don't know, okay? And what changes in a scene, right? Right. This is, this is what changes, which is his entire life has just changed. Um, at no, you don't go back from this. That's, that no matter what happens next, this is a life-changing event. And how you deal with it changes everything else. So we're, I, I came up with three different things. In this case, the first case was, was the Lawrence Block case, which was unwilling father. But let's say uh, that there is, they, they, these two people never had sex. This, this guy, this girl. But they were together the night that they were both abducted by aliens. And they were both hoping that this was just a shared hallucination. But now she's pregnant. It's not his. But we don't even know. It's not a case of whose is it. It's what's is it. <laughs> um, and then the third one is uh, she does not know something about him and is trying to use a situation as blackmail, but does not know that Bob was snipped. So <laughs> whoever's it is, it ain't his. So um, that is how, that is the, the shortest possible scene you can do, uh, is, is three words in which you have the implied one character because that that is the character speaking that puts one character into the scene the person they are speaking to is the other character so that's your protagonist and your antagonist um and sometimes the situation itself can be the antagonist um but it generally takes more than three words to get that that thing done dialogue is almost the only way you can do a three word scene but um and then conflict we discovered th three different kinds of conflict for that exact sentence. And then twist, which is the thing that changes. Which, <laughs> I, th yeah. I thought of a three-word sentence that I would, it's like, Phil, I'm dead. <laughs> like Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. In dialogue. Okay. That, that's something that I would use in one of mine, I think. <laughs> no, let's let's break that down because, okay, the, 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 the protagonist, the speaker, is dead. Okay, so the conflict... The antagonist would be the situation at that point, I would think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The conflict this... would be what? The fact that she's still speaking or he's still speaking. Uh-huh. How is that possible? Yeah, yeah. It's... Which is also the twist. Mm-hmm. Which well, is... Well, the twist could also be that the person's now dead. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's going to change it. <laughs> that... That... Yeah. Yeah. Being dead, still talking, that's a situation. That's one of the ones that I'm actually using. Yeah, in, yeah, with your Dead Man's yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah, Dead Man's Party. Uh, yeah, so, but that is a really good example of a three-word scene. And I would like to recommend that if you're listening to this, this is not technically a workshop, but because there are no worksheets for it, but it would not hurt you to sit down, think about, the story that you are telling, and see if you can figure out a three-word scene. Somewhere in there's something where you just, you, you put in your little hash marks or you make it its own chapter or whatever, and then you write three words and you drop a bomb on somebody's head in, in the story, and then you move on. Um, this is really, really good practice. Okay. And then our next is, oh, okay. This is... Nanny, oh boy, I've got to read my, oh, okay, I had to read my writing there, <laughs> a little, little, little wonky on me. Um, Nancy vanished from the street. That can be an entire scene. Now, that's four words, because we have a setting in there that mm -hmm. is not implied. The setting is the street. Vanished is the conflict the protagonist, or well, the protagonist is Nancy from because this well, it is could her be scene. whoever saw it happen too. Because right? I mean, if if it's 
somebody watching it that could be the protagonist nancy disappearing nancy could be the antagonist because that's not what you were expecting right <laughs> so right right so okay so then let's look at contexts here context number one is there is an observer who sees nancy blink out of existence um you generally are going to need a little bit more setup there uh you are going to need another sentence maybe where um bob buys bob stood on the corner nancy blinked out of existence and we'll assume that there was a previous scene where they were together or where there was some reason why you would know who nancy is and you would know who bob is yeah but um okay the next one is an, a second context for this sentence is uh let's say a hooker doesn't show up for work Nancy blinked out of existence, okay? All of the girls that she was working with on the street expect her to show up. Her um, boss expects her to show up. <laughs> well, we can't say pimp. <laughs> I, <know>. <laughs> I just don't think that's the, the, the same. The, is that the current slang? I don't know. Yes, yeah. yeah pimp, oh, so. pimp is still a pimp. <laughs> pimp is still a pimp, okay. So, yeah, because, you know, I've heard that, that that's all oh, that car is so pimp. That is not current. <laughs> okay, very good. Glad to know. Yes, I, I don't get a lot of out time where I get to practice on my, no, up, keeping fine. my slang up to date. So, um, so the, the, we assume the hooker is the protagonist, but if, let's say, she was supposed to be an informant for a cop and she didn't show up for work, the situation is different than if she is just doing her job and she yeah. doesn't show up for work. Because then she's the antagonist of that scene and the cop is, you know, the protagonist. Right. Right. Okay. And then there's a third thing, um, which is Nancy is someone we don't know anything about her, but there is a limo that spews out thugs who grab her and drag her into the limo and the limo races off into someplace and you could start a book that way but again you do need that second sentence in there where we see a car pull up and thugs jump out and drag a woman into the car and then the sentence nancy vanished from the street and never to be heard from again yeah i was thinking of um child abduction oddly enough like okay that works too yeah yeah so that's as far as these go, like you're getting the elements you need in the scene, but these are very, very extreme examples of very short scenes. Yes. I, I wanted to be able to demo yeah. the extreme short end because if you are writing routinely 3,000 word scenes, that's not necessarily a bad thing if the writing is primarily dialogue and action and if the dialogue is not people talking about non-essentials yeah like the um, weather and, or yeah. as you know bob or exposition yeah. exposition disguised as dialogue and if the action is interesting and and moves back and forth and moves the scene forward um this is um writing scenes is is an art form and writing shorter scenes allows you to get better and tighter at writing longer scenes. So it is a really good practice to see how short you can go. Yeah, I'm going to mention two things real quick. Um, okay. If you haven't taken the how to write a flash fiction that doesn't suck course, I know we mention it a lot, but if you haven't taken it, this is a really good way to kind of, it's a free, it's a good way to kind of practice and figure out um, ways to shorten an entire story, which uh -huh. would in turn actually help you writing better scenes. It, I've seen the improvement on my own end just after taking that how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck course. And it's free, hollyswritingclasses.com. It's something that you get automatically. So if you already have an account there, just go into the classes section. You'll see it on your classes. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is how to write page turning scenes. Now, is this one a clinic? That's a clinic, yes. Okay, so, so this one yeah. is under $10 and it teaches you how to write page turning scenes. It teaches you 
um, more in depth of the things that we're going over for free here. So if you do have, you know, the the a problem with scenes. Yeah. Yeah. If you do have the problem where your scenes are running a little bit longer and you listen to this and you want to learn a little bit more, go in more depth. It's it's on, you know, we'll, we'll link it in the show notes, but it's also on hollyswritingclasses.com. It is how to write page turning scenes. Yeah. And it has worksheets. Yes. Lots of them. Lots so, of worksheets. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But yeah, so let's let's keep going. Let's get into really the question. Like, if your work is three thousand words, now, like Holly said, scenes can go that long and be intriguing and enveloping mm-hmm. and stuff. But my thought is, this person already knows that he or she is putting way too much information and way too many things that doesn't matter. Right. There's a lot of non-essentials. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me give my, my third example here, which is. The pink spot on the ceiling went red, and a drop of blood crawled down the wall. That is an entire scene. It's just one sentence. It's a longer sentence because we have a clear definition of the setting. It's The setting is a ceiling, which implies a room, um, and we don't have any characters, but we have blood. And blood implies something or someone upstairs where something bad has happened. So this is just setting and just action. The, the conflict is invisible. It happened before. And whatever the conflict was, the results of the conflict are what's happening when the scene starts and ends. But if you look at the scene itself, just the scene itself, it seems like the, white, the regular room would mm-hmm. be the protagonist. The pink spot could be the antagonist because it's changing the room and not Mm -hmm. in a way that it should. The fact that it's growing and now it's dripping would be the conflict. Mm -hmm. The twist is also the fact that it's, you know, you know there's something wrong. Right. The question, the the twist there is this question. Um, What, what don't I know? Yeah. Right. So it, these scenes always have every element in them yeah it's just sometimes a little tricky to define the elements yeah and that's that's like with the bob i'm pregnant thing is that obviously there is a setting it's just it's invisible so it's not Mm -hmm. technically there but it's implied that's why it's it's just some sometimes these can be a little bit tricky and you have to play around with stuff to figure it out but that's part of the fun for writing nerds i think Yes, yes, exactly. It, it is the science behind this. Yeah. Uh, in, in finding the little pieces because they are always there. It's just how are they there and mm-hmm. why does this scene work? Um, so my, my three different takes on this, the obvious one is there's a body in the attic. You know, if there's blood running down the wall and it might not be human, it could be an animal, but there is... You know, obviously there is a body in the attic, okay? The second one is also pretty obvious. Well, someone or something is injured up there. Not dead, but bleeding. And the third one is kind of cool. This one is a little twistier. It's a trap. There's actually not anything up there, but some blood that is designed to get someone to go up the stairs and go look. Yeah, it could At be which if point? it's a ghost story, it could be not even real blood. It could be. Exactly. It could be phantom blood. I like that. That's a nice twist. Um, so then what we are doing here is you the scene, a scene, is about what you show, but it's also about what you hide. It's about the parts of the scene that push the reader to ask a question. And again, you know, what doesn't the reader know with Bob, I'm pregnant? It's, it's that they don't know the situation behind it. Um, the unwilling father or the alien experimentation or the fact that Bob was snipped and could not possibly be the father. Um, all of these bring something different to it that you will find out in a later scene, but it leaves the reader with a question. Um, again, the... Uh, Nancy vanished from the street. The The situation in a very short sentence like that is is not just, well, why did she vanish, but how? 
and what other story is behind that and who was she related to that might have vanished her and who was she related to that might have saved her um, and you these are things that you as the writer have to think about you have to say okay well what do I want to show and what do I want to hide and the part that you hide is what helps you make the scene shorter and what helps you give it the hook that keeps the reader reading. Um, and what I have here, let's see, you want to keep your reader turning pages and to do that you always have to keep something to yourself. And what you keep to yourself is, can be tricky it, because as you're writing it, sometimes you will do these scenes and you won't know. You won't know why you wrote this tiny short scene and then just moved on to the next thing. Um, I did one the other day that was like a paragraph and a half, maybe, maybe 25, maybe 30 words, a whole scene. I thought it was 250 something. That one was a different scene. Oh, the okay. one that I started. Yeah. The one that I started the book with that I, I had to go back and start the book. And I actually used it as this week's, um, demo. Or this week's snippet, um, snippet, yeah. So that's it's that particular scene. The book, the scene that now starts, Dead Man's Party is on my blog. And it, yeah, if you guys didn't know, she does Friday snippets where she posts uh, very short little bits of what she's writing every Friday uh -huh. at hollylyle.com. That's l i s l e dot com. Yes, yes. <laughs> and sometimes I forget. And if I forget, I don't do a backup one. I just wait until the next week and post another one because, yeah, yeah the chaos, there's lots of it right now. And mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. So um, when, when it comes to looking at what you're hiding, sometimes you know. Like I know I've, I've dropped a couple of little hints here and there through the book that I'm writing right now where it's not even a hint where I'm just mentioning something in passing that's going to turn up at the very end to be something important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that you can include very easily within just a couple of words. But when it comes to, let's, let's go over, and I know we've talked about this before, and we've just mentioned protagonist, antagonist, setting, conflict, twist. The, when it comes to 3,000 word scenes that are dragging on, you kind of have to know what the point of the scene is. Mm -hmm. So you have to go into each scene like, okay, well, this is the point of this one. And know your packs, which is the protagonist, antagonist, conflict, twist, and setting. So that alone, knowing, okay, well, the point of this scene is that Nancy vanishes from the street. And mm -hmm. she was going to be this cop's informant. So, and then you have your, your packs down. That will help. And it's better to write lean. It's, it's better to, to write just to the point of the scenes than to feel like you have to write the exposition or feel like you have to put in a whole bunch of setting description or feel like you, you it's, it's better to just write in first draft the point of all the scenes because it's easier to add oh yeah than it is to have to go through and cut oh cutting cutting is heartbreaking and grueling because you keep thinking oh but i wrote all those words mm -hmm. whereas if you come in short you can add more words unless you have a very tight contract um in which case yeah. But, yeah, we're not looking at, at, at that. We're no. looking at more like, okay, my scenes are dragging on. It, mm -hmm. it also kind of, maybe you're accidentally putting in too much stuff into one scene. Mm -hmm. um, you might need to find a way to chop those scenes up into different scenes. Yeah, exactly. At the point where you're asking, well, what does this scene do? Why is this scene in the book? You need to be able that to, to answer that in one sentence. That sentence, 30 words, protagonist versus, or which is conflict, antagonist in a setting with a twist. And in that 30 words, one thing happens that matters. And that one thing is going to, can be, can be, you know, well, uh, the earthquake hits. 
that's a big thing. And there might be a lot of description go that goes into that scene. There might be um, somebody might get killed in the scene. Somebody might survive. Somebody might rescue somebody else. Uh, a lot of things can happen in the scene, but the scene has a point. The point is show the earthquake. The next Just, scene. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say describe a Franken scene. Okay. The Franken scene is where you get on a roll and you show the earthquake and then you show the day after the earthquake and then you show uh, the people who are someplace else that are looking at um, the, the people who are digging themselves out of the rubble and then you, and it just shifts and moves and adds and, and collects like spare parts and stuff that doesn't fit in that one scene. A scene is a discrete, specific action, um, conflict with specific characters. And when you change your setting, when you change the point of view, when you change um, the twist, the, the thing that changes, you are writing a new scene. But frequently people don't make a break. They just keep writing. And... Uh, learning to identify when a scene ends is a pro-level skill. It is an easy-to-learn pro-level skill, but Franken scenes are something that kill kill sales because yeah, you don't even yeah. have to say it's like that earthquake. There's um, I don't remember exactly what the example was, and I don't remember if it was what course it was in. It might have been how to revise your novel. It might have been because since that's the one I'm taking, that's the one I'm thinking. 90% mm -hmm. sure it's in there but basically it was like um it was one restaurant scene it was like Bob comes in like okay so there's Kate and Bob and they're sitting there and they're eating dinner and then John comes in and he's like oh you cheated on me and then uh, Becky's over here and she's like I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, and then and then somebody kills and shoots the other person while the other person was talking about having just published their book, and, and then Becky's screaming because she doesn't know who the father is. It, I'm not, that's not the one that you used, but it was, it's basic, I was basing it off of what you yes, used. Yes, that is a very good Frankenstein. <laughs> yes, there was way, way, way too much happening all right. at once, and it, but it was also how it's described, so like, you can have a lot going on in one scene and leaving everybody go, what the hell just happened? Mm -hmm. But it has to be done really well. And that and it particular can't change instance, point of view. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You can't head hop. No, no. That's the, the instant you head hop, the instant you jump from one character's point of view to another, you have changed scenes, whether you have broken them up as scenes or not. Yeah. And at the point where you are jumping in and out of other people's heads, that's going to get you rejected. Um, because that is, that is a sign of having poor control over your story. It should get you yeah, rejected. It, there's there's a lot a, of, uh, publishers out there that, that don't put out the, the best quality work that, mm -hmm. that will still allow things like that in, which is a fault it's a on rookie the editor. Mistake, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so head hopping is one thing you could run into with 3000 word. Uh, not knowing when your scene starts or when it ends because mm -hmm. like they said they want to get better at getting in and getting out and getting it done so right. there's this thing that is with screenwriters which I know is also with writers in general is you come into a scene late and you leave early but right. that can be very confusing to a lot of new people or a lot of people trying to get a scene down so what does it mean to come into a scene late and leave early how would you describe that in a way that isn't like i'm leaving shit out okay well the example for that again is going to be bob i'm pregnant um because coming into that you can't get any later in the scene than that that there was yeah well so let's say what what what, what we missed what was not included in that Okay, what was not included that in that was them sitting in a restaurant, um, him buying... The waiter bringing them food. <laughs> right, the waiter bringing them food, uh, them, her saying something catty about some woman uh, who they both kind of... Yeah, the small talk. There was no small talk. Yeah, the small talk, right, the chit-chat. Um, there's, he orders wine for the table, 
And then she says, Bob, I'm pregnant. Yeah. Okay. So as far as getting in late, we, we came in late. Now, how right. about getting out early? What There was no response. Right. Right. There was no reaction from Bob. There was just, Bob, I'm pregnant. Pregnant. Preg- I'm pregnant. That's it. Pregnant. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, and, and this is this is an extreme version again because you have to you have to have faith in your readers that they know the character because mm-hmm. they, then they're going to know like oh shit just hit the fan for Chip because Ooh. I know Chip. Chip is a playboy. Chip does not want to be tied down. Chip has three or four girlfriends in a book. Yeah. So th- this is assuming that the reader knows all of that. Now, if the reader right. doesn't know all of that, then there's a certain amount that you're going to use. So let's go back to the Nancy thing. Let's use this as an example for coming in late and leaving early. Okay. The Nancy was, let's, let's go with the hooker. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so we have, we have the hooker. We have the car that drags her off. We have, so at, you will have, To get the importance of this, you basically have to know what kind of novel this is. There has to have been at least a scene beforehand. Okay, so let's say it's, it's, we know already a little bit that the cop is the protagonist, that Mm -hmm. Nancy is going to be the informant, let's say that it was um, drug deals and murders, Mm -hmm. and let's say that we know that he was supposed to meet her that day which is why he was there to see her blink out of existence or vanish or whatever right right where he sees um oh you know he either sees her just disappear which makes this an entirely different kind of book no yeah or he sees guys grab her off the street drag her into a car he's a cop he will at least get a partial on the license plate if he doesn't memorize the whole thing and if you want to make it even harder for him he shows up and she's not there and he starts asking the other girls and the girls saw this happen so right. they're not going to necessarily get the the plate because they don't know if they're going after them it's not like they don't know they're hookers they know to get a plate number but they don't know if Nancy's the intended target or if it's anyone near so maybe they'll scatter right or maybe this was could have been any of them yeah. And, uh, you know, now they're not wanting to talk to anybody because, well, if you talk, bad things might happen. And who yep. knows what Nancy did? There's a lot there. They don't know about her being a cop's informant and he's not going to tell. Right. Exactly. You know, so you there are a lot of things that you can have in here and not say and still get away with that sentence. But that is starting late. If, if, it, if you don't even see this happen... That's starting late. That's stop, starting with the cop showing up and getting starting to get reports from the girls who are working the street and realizing that the person who he was supposed to be meeting with and who he is in te- instead doing this thing for uh, was his informant. Yeah. And, yeah, and now is it because she was his informant and somebody knows or is it something else? So let's use an example from one of your books, and it's an example that we have used, um, or the book is is Hunting the Corrigan's Blood. I'll put a link in the show notes if you haven't read it. Mm-hmm. Let's start with the very, very first scene, because this is, not only is this starting late, <laughs> um, or getting in late and leaving early, but it is also a great way to introduce the character where you're where you're getting in very late on the character this is the first mm-hmm. time you ever ever meet Caden Drake right. and talk about getting in late for this yes. scene she is basically almost dead so yeah. you are meeting her as she is dying yes yes that is exactly it uh the getting in late part there was because I despise exposition. And I could think of just tons of ways to start the book. But starting the book with her already in the deepest trouble you can be in. She is welded into a locker with a corpse who is welded to her. They they have a, a binding that has the two of them locked together. Yeah, it's called Molly Bond, and it bonds like your your skin. So they're basically skin to skin bonded together. Yeah, and until the corpse has deteriorated enough to fall apart, they're not getting apart, 
And by the time that happens, the main character is also going to be dead. And she's pretty close anyway because she was jumped on and beaten and she has a broken leg and some internal bleeding. And this is and she has passed out a number of times. The corpse has started talking to her. And, and she's yeah. been in there for a while. Yeah, because uh-huh. the corpse is starting to decay. So, I mean, you're getting in very, very late. And the scene ends when she manages to catch the attention of a, a floor cleaning robot that is wired to report in any anomalies and it the anomaly is her banging her head on the inside of the locker which gets the robot to call help and she thinks she's already dead she is hallucinating again and thinks she's already dead when they open the door yeah and you don't actually get the moment of oh she's going to be okay or oh we're going to save her all all you get is her still thinking that she's dead and it talk about leaving early is like you don't you don't know anything you you i mean there's a lot in that scene and it's actually Mm -hmm. it's got some really good humor too because not just between her and the corpse and then her and her her internal thoughts but then the robot is annoyed by the fact that all these people are here because it's trying to do its job and it's cleaning up the mess that she made and it's it's a very good funny scene and it's a very good first scene of a book and it's also a great example of getting in late and leaving early. Um, there's not a lot of exposition. You're still wondering, okay, well, who is this character? Like, what the hell happened to her? Because you don't right. know. I didn't say anything about that yeah. at all. I did not bother to describe her job. I did not bother to describe her friends. I did not do anything. Yeah, there might have been a little except- bit in there about what she did as far as Mm -hmm. but it wasn't it wasn't in an expository manner it was no it was very fluid and natural and if you you know if you haven't read that scene it's a great one to read can you think of any other ones in your work that were that were like that that you could just kind of pull out and then Offhand, no, because because I am buried in two separate books right yeah, now. Yeah, and there's some and of those that, all, like, yeah. as far as me, I have a couple of scenes that, but I don't want to yeah. give them away or anything because that's why it's easier to pull out that particular scene. But a lot of... I think that one, however, might be linked on my website uh, as the first chapter of Hunting the Corgan's Blood, and if it... I can find it if it is. Yeah. Yeah. And if it isn't, you can always go to Amazon and read the first chapter free. But again, you know, if you value what we're doing here, you can always buy Holly's book if you haven't read it yet. I, I, it's, it's got a whole <laughs> bunch of the, there's a whole bunch of leaving or, or getting in late and leaving early. And it's it's kind of extreme examples in many ways because it is kind of a, I look at it as a detective noir book in space, mm-hmm. um, but she's saying it's a lot of urban fantasy, which I can kind of get. I kind of get what you're saying because there is um, the paranormal element to it mm-hmm. and stuff. But when it comes to the scenes, so what you're looking to cut, what would you say if if you've got a person who's sitting there with a 3,000 plus scene where they know that it goes on, where it drags what would you tell them to start looking for as far as cutting? Okay. Um, well, first off, in first draft, you don't cut anything. Yeah. Finish. Let's, yeah, let's, let's assume that this entire book is done or story or whatever it is. Exactly. The book, the story, whatever, in first draft is finished. You don't touch first draft. You just write it and go on. Yeah, until you get to the end. Yeah. You, you just let the mistake sit there and then you go back afterwards. But once you are going back, what you are looking for is, well, are they saying anything important in the dialogue? Is, is this just people talking about the weather and making chit chat? Or is there a point to this? Is how does the dialogue address the conflict the thing that has to change in the story, the part that, that the whole reason that we are reading this scene, can you define what that reason is? It's not, it's not somebody sitting there thinking about the weather. It is today is the end of the world. Yeah. You don't want, I understand people want to give it a certain feel. They want to give Mm -hmm. like, uh, okay, let's say I'm writing a small town romance and I want to give it a certain feel, 
but you don't want to have chatty chatting dialogue oh, about the weather right. unless there's something interesting. So let's say Bob comes up to Kate and he's talking, well, isn't it a lovely day today? Look at these, these beautiful skies, no clouds at all. So Kate will then say, yeah, so let's have Kate put in some small town gossip, something that, mm -hmm. that will later have a point to do with the story, but at the same time still gives that feel. Like the intro, because when you start talking to somebody in a small town, sometimes it does have to be uh, just a simple little weather thing. It's an etiquette thing. Let's just talk of, let's just, oh, you know, start talking about something simple. And then the, the punch is, okay, well, now we can get to the gossip because we got the etiquette out of the way. Right. So then you put in the small town gossip that has to do with the story. And that way you only got one line of of the quote boring dialogue in but it's not boring because mm -hmm. it's setting the scene for right. setting up a conflict for yeah. later yeah, yeah it's uh, for example um kate is talking to bob bob says uh, you know oh it's so this is great weather and she says it is and your wife looks so cute yesterday dressed up and and in, in her high heels and with her makeup done and you know uh, she, she just looked gorgeous and he didn't know about it and <laughs> He didn't know about yeah. it. Yeah, you know, and you just run right on by that. You just let that sit there. And then next day, Bob's wife shows up dead. <laughs> oh, I was so, going to say maybe a less extreme version. Like, if you want to write a small town kind of book, like, that doesn't include murder, but includes the well, drama, then, you know, you have him talk about the weather real quick, and then the woman says something like, oh, yeah, well, um, I can you, can you believe Bessie was in her her skimpy little two piece and and you know we saw how see now i'm i'm thinking murder i can't get out of it <laughs> but it's it there is a way to do these things to have the dialogue look like casual weather talking dialogue but have it yes. matter yes yeah it, there it, there is and it is subtle it, it's it takes practice it's one of those things that the scenes class uh actually goes into detail with is how you do this there well there's also there's also writing subtext in in dialogue which i will link in the show notes as well but i don't mm -hmm. i don't want to keep bringing up you know like oh go yeah, go buy this or anything because, yeah. but yeah yeah i don't like doing that um so so basically okay you're looking at the purpose of the dialogue you are looking at the purpose of the setting. If you say it's a beautiful day, that has to matter. That you don't just say it's a beautiful day because you wanted them to have nice weather. It's a beautiful sunny day because it's going to change. Or it's a beautiful sunny day because it and it's super super hot and mm -hmm. the heat is going to affect something or yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful sunny day because it's the last one ever. <laughs> Okay, something is going to, and that's, that's a lot of the, the uh, urban fantasy that I'm reading now has a certain amount of that in it. Well, you know, the characters start, things are a little happy, and then the world shifts, the world ends, something horrific happens. And the change there from, oh, this was so nice, bam, is the point of the scene. And it's been very well done yeah if you're talking about like details and descriptions and stuff a lot of times um you don't want to mention something unless you want to give a very basic idea of the setting so like with wanda wanda lucia i mentioned the pre-antebellum home pre-antebellum home um or mm -hmm. the antebellum home i don't <laughs> at this point i don't remember yeah it is. it's yeah. um but you'll mention a couple of little things here and there that fit with the aesthetic. Mine was Deep South um, with historical landmarks. But at the same time, like, I'll mention when she's at the mechanics. You know, she just takes a brief look around and she mentions she, she'll see that the shop is very well organized. Well, that lends to Philip's character. He's a very anal retentive mm -hmm. when it comes to his shop. She notices a 
a chain link fence that keeps the security in or there's lots of cars in there and it's just basic her basically looking around but the chain link fence came back because that night yeah. she broke into to the shop so because she didn't have money she couldn't she there was nowhere for her to stay so she broke into the shop to sleep in her car but she got busted and part of the the chain link fence she got caught on the chain link fence and and her shoe fell off and it was just it was adding more badness to her already bad day i i brought it back to that fence that i mentioned that had glinted in the sunlight or something like that and again it's 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 mentioning these little things that give you double use you're not just right. setting the scene but then you're also setting up future conflict which is something that i learned uh from the how to revise your novel course and one of the things that i want to mention here too is that in first draft you will be throwing a lot of stuff in there that does not seem to have a purpose and it will be very tempting to take it out as you're writing don't yeah because you don't know until the book is finished what the story is actually going to be you think you know but then you read back through it and you discover that you had this thing that you put in a room. You, know, you have this little something. And it turns out that that something gives the character a reason to do something good or something evil. Or it gives the story extra depth because it belonged to someone you didn't even know existed that turns out to be crucial to who this character becomes. Yeah, the, Holly calls it uh, toys on the floor. And it's something that yes. we have been requested to do a mini episode on. And we, we might, you know, have to cover that as well. But okay. it can give you subplots. It can give you... And, th and that's the thing is when you're writing first draft, a lot of times you'll get way too heavy into description. Now, this is not personally something that I run into, but I know that it is something that a lot of people do is they'll get heavy mm -hmm. into description or they'll get heavy into exposition. And a lot of this is uh -huh. you learning as the writer what this place looks like, what this person looks like so that you have it gelled in your head, what the history is that makes a difference or that matters or it's kind of like mm -hmm. your world building as you go along but when it comes right. down to it a lot of that can be taken out because it served its purpose in revision it can be taken out leave it in there in the first draft so anytime we're talking about taking anything out it's always after first draft because, yeah. Because a lot, yeah, of what you've written is better than you think yeah, it is. Yeah, and a lot of what you've written is kind of like a secret, it, it, like, need in there that you might actually need mm -hmm. to drop it. But, but what I was going to say, too, is a, while a lot of it can be taken out, like your 20-page description of, of the two different characters, or maybe they, they have this really long conversation about this historical event, what you can do is call it so that her you know her the description of her mentions only the important things like the scar that she hides with her glasses because she never wears contacts because it their glasses cover this little scar that hints towards mm -hmm. a history and something she wants to hide when they're talking about this you know they they go through 10 pages of of history together they talk about this event well you can call that to just a brief mention of how somebody would, you know, like the, the, the inside joke that people, people have inside jokes. They don't have to say the entire joke. They just say a word and they both laugh or they do some gesture and they both laugh. So you would call this down to a natural single reference to that history, mm -hmm. which then leaves your reader wondering, oh my God, you know, like, what does that have to do with anything? And if it's something that comes back later, then you've already introdu introduced the intrigue. You, Yeah, you've given your reader a, a reason to turn the page, to keep reading. Yeah. And until you have written the whole book, you don't know which of the things that are in it are going to be those exactly. things. Exactly. You find those in revision. Exactly, which is why I wanted to mention that you write these super long things and... 
it, it's if you haven't done world building, if you haven't done the plot, if you haven't built up a whole bunch of things, then you're doing this while you write, which makes mm -hmm. cutting that more difficult because you know how important all of this stuff is to your story and you're giving it too much importance to a reader. Whereas if you take all of that out, but maybe a hint here and there, it's even more important to your reader because your reader either notices it or subconsciously it sets in the brain that's more important because then they're going to keep turning the pages and it's not this boring bit of exposition or boring bit of description again we go back to what doesn't the reader yeah, know yeah exactly and you have to you 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 have to build all this stuff before you know what stuff you can throw in there that's going to be intriguing and interesting that's going to make the reader ask and what stuff you cut out to make it intriguing and interesting yeah yeah exactly exactly so um yeah i think at that point basically we're about ready for the takeaway okay so before we get to the takeaway i just want to remind you guys you can follow us at aia r w i p on twitter you can follow us at Alone with Invisible People on Instagram. Holly also has a personal Instagram. That's Holly period Lyle, L-I-S-L-E. And I have a personal Instagram that's R Gallardo. That's R-G-A-L-A-R-D-O. You can follow us at Alone in a Room with Invisible People on Facebook. And alonewithinvisiblepeople.com is our website where we link all of the show notes, where we also have all of the episodes where you can play directly from the website. We've got free downloads as far as all of the workshops that we have done. We do not require an email, so you can go directly to the page and download. We have transcripts that are also going up as well. We have, I think, the first three episodes done and up. I'm not sure. It might be more at this point. And if you find value in what we're doing, you can find ways to support us at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us. Decide what you want the reader to know in the scene and show that. And this, um, my method of doing that is to work a few scenes ahead uh, in first draft and write out kind of a line for scene outline of what I think I want to write and write specifically to those scenes but only a few scenes ahead and, and in first draft uh, I'll just wing the first couple of chapters in revision it's a line for scene focus outline and then go through and make a big big go through hard <laughs> um yeah but but you don't expect to get it right the first time. You don't have to get it right the first time. The first time is to learn what matters. And you will discover that as you go along. And what matters will change the closer you get to the ending and the closer you understand to the story that you're actually telling. At which point, then you go back and revise the crap out of it. Second, decide what you want to hide and then give the reader a question to take into the next scene or the next few scenes. Um, it took me several scenes to get back from Katie in the locker to um, everything is basically okay until it isn't, I, where she, she had to go through some serious crap to get on to the next part of the story. After I set up this little right in the middle of the worst day of her life to that point, but not the worst day of her life by any means from what happened after that. And then finally, once you have asked the question, once you have got the question into the scene for the reader, stop writing. The scene is done. Move on to the next scene. And this is a thing where you learn this by practice, where you get in there and you get to the part where you, you drop that little piece of something that makes the writer reader go mm -hmm. and at that point you stop and it's it's hard to do because it's very tempting to then run past that <laughs> and write more stuff but don't do that well i mean and again this is this is first draft versus revision so in the first yeah. draft if you're still feeling the scene needs more it, it, you're gonna have to cut it later but right and and also this is something that you will learn with time and and experience is the more you write the more you revise your work and learn what's important mm -hmm. 
the more you'll learn when to start and end a scene. Exactly. And and one final thing I want to say here that I didn't have in the show notes, but as long as you are revising what you've written after it's finished, there are no mistakes in first draft. There is absolutely nothing you can do wrong in first draft as long as you understand that once it's done, you have to go back and revise it. Yeah, and um, that really is a, a, the key to learning a lot of freedom and to getting over ninety mm-hmm. percent of quote writer's block. Um, there are always exceptions with writer's block, like we've discussed in the past. There are mm-hmm. life events. There are medical reasons for writer's block that you know we we can't discuss on. We can't. There, there's sometimes no way to really fix those except to work their way through them. But I think yeah. 90% of writer's block comes from an over-perfectionism. And we covered that in perfectionism in first draft and perfectionism in revision. So if you haven't listened to those episodes, go back and take a look at those. Exactly. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for listening. We love you guys. We love being able to help you and being a part of your writing life. And again, if you want to be a part of the community, hollyswritingclasses.com, create your free account, jump into the forums because we we are there and everybody's there and we love being able to, you know, communicate. Our guys are awesome. <laughs> so that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening, Holly. Yes, and you can do this. Just no matter how frustrating it can sometimes be, just keep telling yourself, I can do this. Because the more you do it, the more you can do it, and the better you'll get.